Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, uh, blessed and prosperous New Year to you in the Lord, because that's the only way you really truly prosper, right? Uh, Carl, thank you so much for uh, sharing last week. Uh, kind of a last second thing, I ended up having to drive to California, um, and then I drove back. And so that's a long drive can be even longer when there's this white stuff that you have to deal with, but we haven't had to deal with the white stuff. You see, for those of you who don't know, I'm relatively new to the area. My family only came in about two years ago, so when we came in, it snowed in like September, and we were working in the springs at that time, and it was winter from September all the way through to like April, and then this past year, like winter just decided to take a vacation right? It seems, at least as far as the white stuff is concerned. Uh, my heritage is a South Pacific Islander, and so that white stuff that falls from the sky where we come from is called volcanic ash, <laughs> which we normally don't like to see fall, and so I don't necessarily like to see the white stuff fall here either, um, especially after having been raised all my formative years in Michigan where that white stuff fell every year, and I got introduced to the lovely thing called shoveling snow. Yes, makes you big and strong, uh, but doesn't necessarily make you very happy that the white stuff falls down from the sky. As, as we begin the new year, it's always good to, for me, in my mind, kind of set the course for the year. Um, last year, we kind of gave everybody forced reading schedules, as forced as we can. We didn't call you every day and make sure you're reading. Um, I have to admit, I got one email uh, or text was in emails. Somebody communicated with me on December 31st that they had just finished the church's reading schedule. And I was felt like, oh, yeah, somebody else did it. Yay. And I thought, and I just didn't sense that the Lord wanted me to throw that out there again this year to kind of put that burden on anyone. However, the strong encouragement is we need to read our Bibles. And there are umpteen resources out there to help you to at least read through it once in a year. And so uh, one of my favorites is at a place called Ligonier Ministries. You can go on there, LigonierMinistries.com, and they'll give you all these printable reading uh, schedules. So you can read it. They've got it in several different ways. Uh, I mean, actually, they have it, I think, almost 20 different ways. Chronologically, uh, only Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, just book by book, chapter by chapter, but it's there to help us. And so uh, Calvary Chapel is a church that is known for The people that come to these little congregations are people of the word. And so I want to highly, strongly encourage you uh, to read your Bible and pray every day as the children's song says, and you'll grow, grow, grow. If you don't know that song, um, Linda's going to sing it for us now. Okay, no. (laughs) Linda's got a cold and she can't sing right now, so it's all good. Um, But the second verse of the song is, don't read your Bible and forget to pray and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And so I'm not going to sing it to you this year, uh, maybe sometime later. But uh, once again, thank you for being here. Uh, Some of you may be wondering, why are we still at the Y, right? Uh, Because God has deemed it so. That's all I can answer. Uh, We thought uh, back in December that we were going to be moving into a real church building um, that somebody has had for a couple years that's been sitting vacant and dormant, uh, but that still hasn't happened. And so I know there's a little bit of like anxiety and a little bit of desire and a lot of like excitement about the new place. Uh, my strong encouragement to us all, be excited about for the place where we are right now because we have no idea where we're going to be tomorrow, let alone next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're planning on being here. That's the plan, okay? So unless you hear differently through uh, text from Loquacious Larry or from the uh, Facebook site or website, Uh, This is where we'll be gathering together. And that's really kind of the segue into today's message. And what Carl spoke on last week and what I'm going to speak on this week, we did not plan this. Um, As a matter of fact, I haven't listened to Carl's message from last week just so that you didn't think that all I'm doing is basically trying to get you to do what Carl told you to do last week. But somebody told me from last week what Carl taught on, how blessed they were, And I thought, oh my goodness, that's basically half of my message this week. And so, once again, beloved, we believe that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us. And when the Spirit's leading and guiding us, guess what? He kind of keeps us on the same track. He's not derailing us week to week difference. And I know we've been going through the book of Acts, 
and we took a little brief break, but that little brief break is probably going to grow and be a little bit bigger. We still haven't gotten to our uh, study on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit yet, which is coming right after this little break, which is another break, and then we'll get back right back into the book of Acts sometime in 2018, okay? But one thing that you do know when you come here is we, we teach the Bible. We come from Scripture, and so it's always going to be good. And that's the encouragement about reading our Bibles, is that you can always take what you read from God to the bank, 24-7, 365, as truth. Not saying you shouldn't read other people's books, but get, remember, that's like going to the meal. That's, that's the, what's those things called on the sides of the meat? Because I'm a carnivore. Right. Yeah, it's whatever, those things that you're supposed to eat when you eat with meat to help the meat get through. Because for me, it's all about the meat. Anybody else here a carnivore? You know, I mean, I mean, there's something about meat. Matter of fact, I was talking with somebody the other day. There's some talk out there and some studies that they're wondering if it, meat actually makes you spiritually stronger. <laughs> I, I like that idea. I like that idea. Not saying that as doctrine, not teaching that right now. But this morning, as we begin... <laughs> okay, so there's some people here who are new. Or haven't been here. Whenever you hear bacon from this side... Uh, that's our converted Jewish person <laughs> who is so happy to be in the, in, the, in the church of God now because there's things that he was said he could never have all his life that he's now getting to experience before the great marriage supper of the Lamb um, that things that he just didn't think he'd ever have. And so uh, this is like those two guys, yeah? Larry and Bruce are bacon brothers, <laughs> separated at birth. Yes. So this morning, we're going to start off in Matthew chapter 16. So if you turn there, what we're going to look at today, if you saw the uh, posting on Facebook, we're going to look at the church for 2018. And this is kind of for us as a body, but I really believe it's what the Lord wants his church to be all about. Today, we're going to look at three main uh, concepts, the foundations of the church, function, and its future. And the beauty of this all for us is that you're going to see it straight in Scripture from the words of Jesus himself what a church is all about. So if you wouldn't mind standing with me this morning, it will be the last time you stand for the next hour and a half. Uh, Matthew chapter 16. And for those of you, that was for you who are new. Everybody else knows. I say that all the time, but no, we, we, we don't. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ." Father, we are so thankful for your word that it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, that it never returns void. It always accomplishes what you set it forth to do. And so as we turn to your word today, we ask you, Holy Spirit, plant your word deep within us and produce the fruit in our lives. Thank you that you are the great vine dresser of our souls. And this morning we yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. It's a pretty familiar passage of Scripture, the one that comes right after it where basically Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan, is a little bit more popular. Uh, but in reality, for what we're looking at today, this is where we get the foundation for church. Church is a word that we hear, and probably when you hear the word church, think, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Building. Yeah, okay, a lot more. I didn't even have to ask you to say it. All I have to do is say it, and it evokes a response. 
But when we're looking at church biblically, it's not a word that's really there frequently. And what we're going to get to and see a little bit later is that maybe the concepts that we have in our mind maybe aren't what God ever intended for church to be. When Jesus talks to his disciples here, he begins this dialogue with them with a question on who do people say that I am? And they kind of throw out. Even though Jesus had been there for a while and been doing things and been saying things, most of the people, would you agree, didn't quite get who Jesus was. How about his disciples? From what we had seen at the time, did they even get it? And even when Peter gives the right answer, what does Jesus qualify his answer with? <laughs> that really wasn't of you, Peter. My father just revealed that to you. And if we don't get that, guess what? In the passage right after, this same guy who gave the right answer basically gets called by Jesus, Satan. So we get it, right? The concept of who Jesus is wasn't quite understood, but the concept of who Jesus is is paramount and tantamount for his church. The reason being, this statement by Peter, you are Peter and on this rock, unfortunately was misinterpreted by some guys later to think that Peter was going to be the head of the church, right? We understand that. Anybody grew up in one of those church backgrounds where Peter was supposedly the head of the church starting here, right? For those of us who grew up in that background, um, it's extremely off. <laughs> it missed the truth. God bless you. Now, this person of Peter, uh, we know that linguistically, and we hear kind of how they dance around this within the Roman Catholic Church concerning whether Peter is actually supposedly by Jesus here being called the head of the church. Uh, there's three ways that we can see that it's not true. Number one, linguistically. When Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock, he doesn't say you are Peter and on you I will build my church. And you can go into the, some deep linguistics on here and see that there is nowhere intimated in Jesus' statement that Peter was supposed to be the head of the church and that Jesus was going to build his church on it. Historically, we know that Peter was a great man of God, but we also know from the historicity of this passage alone that he went from being the guy who gave the right answer to the guy who's being called Satan. Would God choose that guy to build his church upon? And then just theologically, why would God choose to build his church upon a man when the Son of God was here? And when the Son of God... It, it's not really that hard to see that, okay, um, this teaching and this thought that it was actually this guy that Christ was saying he was going to build his church on, it all falls apart very quickly. But when we see it for what it says here, when Jesus refers to on this rock, that Jesus is referring to that rock of revelation, that statement that Peter says, what? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the foundation for the church. And it makes it really easy because if you want to know if the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing, it comes back through this sieve of you are the Christ, the Son of God. Is what we are doing as a local body proclaiming the fact that Jesus is the Son of the living God, the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the one that God sent, and you have to remember that too, within the Jewish context of this all, Christ means Messiah. And for this group of people that Jesus came to bring the gospel to first, they needed to know who their Savior, who their Messiah was. And for the rest of the world, guess what? We get brought in as well in the benefits of it. But this is clear, unequivocal, and cannot be argued. This is the foundation of the church. How many of you remember the hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord? Okay, the song could have ended right there. But we as human beings like to make songs that have verses and more verses and like to say things. And sometimes some of the newer churches kind of get it where they just say this one thing over and over. And sometimes they get bagged on because it sounds too much like an Eastern mysticism mantra. But sometimes the fact of the matter is we simply need to state these biblical truths. And that's the be all and end all of it all. Here's the be all and end all. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the rock. That is the foundation. And when we see that, guess what? It makes it easier for us to come alongside with the fact that when he says next, I will build my church. Whose church is it? 
a real church of Jesus Christ, not of the Latter-day Saints, a real church of Jesus Christ is Jesus' church. And he's talking about a worldwide group, and we'll get to that in a second. But every local church body needs to submit to the fact that if we are going to be really followers of Jesus Christ, the church belongs to Jesus. And from boards and pastors and servants all the way down the line, we have to be willing to submit that if Jesus makes it very clear to us that we need to do something, well, what do we need to do? We need to do it. Why? Because it's his church. I remember uh, at one of the churches that uh, Terry and I first attended, the pastor from the pulpit, it was a turbulent time for the church. There was some division about some doctrine concerning the spiritual gifts. And the pastor from the pulpit said, if this church is too charismatic for you, go down to the street to the Baptist church and begin to cackle almost like a, like a witch. I mean, it was an awkward situation. But the words out of his mouth next condemned him because he, says, he said from the pulpit, he says, I will have a church that I'm going to be happy with. What did that tell us? He saw this is his church. And guess what? If you didn't like his church the way that he liked it, then just go down the street to where those who were less enlightened went and go be one of the less enlightened and that's exactly what was coming from the pulpit beloved the church is jesus's and when you're not experiencing and sensing that whoever's in front or however it's going isn't seeing this as jesus's church then it's probably not a place where you need to be and so this church this whole concept it's jesus's and guess what who's building it what does he say he's going to build it it's been a little bit tough for me over the last couple of weeks with the whole concept of us possibly moving to the new place because everybody's excited, me included. It's kind of nice not having to set up chairs every morning on Sunday. But at the same time, I came from a church that we had 1,500 chairs that we set up every week and took down every week because it was a gymnasium that we used as a gym during the week. So this going through it over and over and with everybody kind of getting excited and everybody texting me like, have we heard anything new yet? You know, and people really getting excited even to the point that like somebody printed up business cards with our new address there. And as soon as I saw that, my initial mindset was, oh no, they jinxed us. <laughs> right? And immediately you go, gosh, did you even just think that thought? How did you think? You're thinking, There's no such thing as jinxing like that. But at the same time, I'm going, Lord, is this what you want for us to do? Guess what? We're just going to back off and just kind of see what happens because unless you are building the church, Scripture says, unless the Lord build the house, what? Those that labor, labor in vain. And so as much as we all kind of want to get to a, a place that's more permanent than this, it's kind of seeming that God is saying, well, that's not necessarily my plan for you at the moment, right? Yeah. And how do we deal with that? How we respond lets us know whether or not we see this as his church or it's ours. Because very easily, as a human being, as a man, especially as a man, you know what men are. Men are guys with an X and a Y. You women have these two X chromosomes. You are solid. You know how to do squats. Men, we're half solid and we're half flamingo because we have these Y chromosomes that only have one leg, right? In, in here, our humanity, it would have been very, quote unquote, easy just to go out and to get someplace and rent it and just do it to make it happen. You know, this is the 21st century. Just make it happen, bastard. It's like, unless the Lord build the house, beloved, those that labor, labor in vain. And it's almost like, are we like saying, Lord, the why is not good for us? It's not good enough for us? You know what I'm saying? And so it's been coming back to the Lord and going, okay, it's yours, you're doing it. Your church, you're building it. And you're building it upon the rock of not that we can have a place that we can say that we're more like a quote-unquote real church now. Because I think we're going to see as we come up here, by Jesus' definition, we are a real church, regardless of what building we meet in or do not meet in. Uh, there's a church in Hawaii that for, I don't think, seven years met on the beach. You will never go to a better dressed church than that one. I mean, on the beach, sand, 
ocean, palm trees. I mean, perfect weather obviously helps. Sometimes it rains, though, right? And they have to deal with it. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus is building his church, and as long as we will yield to what he's doing in our local congregation as part of that church, guess what? He's going to build something beautiful. Why? Because who's the builder? Have you looked around lately and saw what Jesus has made? Called the universe? Pretty impressive, you know? Seen some things uh, that are kind of impressive that men have built, but then you all of a sudden look at the universe and go, okay, God, we get it. You are the master builder. And as a master builder, what does every master builder and where's... Oh, good, there you are. What is the, build, what is the most important thing to a building when you're going to build something new? Foundation, foundation, right? And here's the foundation that we see. The bedrock truth is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. If we build any type of local congregation church on anything besides that, guess what's going to happen? It will not weather the test of time. However, understand that there are organizations out there that are calling themselves churches that look by world standards as the church church and very successful. But there will come a day when what's really true will be judged and we're going to see. And maybe we might even be surprised to see what actually was part of God's church and what is not. So Jesus, this great contractor, is building with this solid foundation the bedrock truth that he's the Messiah. Well, there's a song from the past, and I couldn't get the lady to actually come here and sing it. Um, Her name's Sandy Patty. Uh, Right, that's why I couldn't get her to come here and sing it. Um, And I was going to show you the video of her actually singing it, but for me, words are important, and so we're getting the version that actually has the word so you'll actually know specifically what she's saying because I think that's important to us. So uh, please welcome your New Year's guest, uh, Miss Sandy Patty. Now that song has always impressed me from the first time I've heard it and I've always loved it, but I will say this. um, I try not to be like Mr. Critic of songs, especially when things are being said Mm, poetically. But that isn't what Scripture says. As much as I love the song, as much as it gets me thinking, I can take it to the last line. You saw in the very last line that it's, I'll build my church. But all throughout the song, it's, I'll build my kingdom. Well, beloved, Jesus isn't building his kingdom. Matter of fact, when he came on planet Earth, he already told his, everyone the kingdom's already here. He's not building the kingdom. What he's building is the church. And that's who we are. And so this morning, as much as maybe you've, how many of you had heard that song before? You have never heard Sandy, you of all people, you had never heard Sandy Patty sing Upon This Rock? Larry. (laughs) Somebody said, I have a Christmas album. Yeah, well, that song, um, very moving, very inspirational, very much widely known for most people. Um, And it gets the point across, but unfortunately, we need to remember, Jesus isn't building the kingdom. The kingdom has already been built by his heavenly father. He came as a representative of the kingdom, but what he says very specifically in scriptures, I will build my church. Kingdom's already established. And that makes it a whole lot easier for us, guess what? To build the church. Because the kingdom is already established and the church is just an extension arm of the kingdom that already exists. And so... Love the song, but make sure when you're listening to songs, sometimes it's pretty easy to kind of get some things that are slightly off deep down within you just because the song had a catchy tune. How many of us have rock and roll lyrics from the 60s, 70s, maybe some of you from the 50s, 80s, 90s, whenevers, that are stuck, that something will trigger and bring out? Remember, those things, that's why the enemy has used music, but also, beloved, that's why the people of the Lord use music as well. So he talks about uh, his kingdom in John 18. Remember when we went through that? Even when he's being questioned by Pilate, this is about him him being the king of the Jews. And he does not in any way, shape, or form except straightforward say that my kingdom is not of this world. We know that Jesus is the king, and that should change how we go about being his followers as he builds his church. Well, in this process of obedience to his father's plan, 
Jesus came to earth to build something, right? He just said it. What's he building? He's building his church. Now, this is one of those things to where uh, Doug, our resident uh, Greek theologian and, and language specialist, I think will agree with me on this. I hope so. Um, when you look at that word, ecclesia, or some of us will say ecclesia or ecclesia because we know of the book Ecclesiastes, but that word that Jesus chose there was a very specific word because there's actually a word in Greek that's actually a better word to be translated church, and that's kyriakos. Yeah, just let that one fly right through your snout. But when he chose the word ecclesia, I believe he was telling us something very specific that the early translators may not have picked up on. Not saying that I have picked up on this and admire wisdom. No, there's a lot of guys who actually believe this and see this. This ecclesia, two big, uh, basic Greek words, or ek and kaleo, called out. And so when Jesus is saying that he's going to build his called out ones, we see this, that this church then in its best definition is this. It's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. And this word that Jesus chose was long being used within Greek culture before he used it. So when he said this, when people heard him saying that I will build my ecclesia, it wasn't a new concept. It was already happening. No different than when we went through this before when we were going through the Gospel of John, is that when John was talking about the euangelion of Jesus Christ or the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that wasn't a new idea either. As a matter of fact, the guy at the time who was ruling the world by the name of Caesar had his own euangelion, and it was used in that exact same term. It was the euangelion of Caesar. And so when John comes and proclaims of the world the euangelion of Jesus Christ or the gospel message, it wasn't like it was a new concept. It was just a new attribute to where it belonged. Caesar may be saying he's got good news for you, but Caesar's good news ain't good news unless you're Caesar, right? But here's the good news of Jesus Christ is that there's a God in heaven who loves everybody equally, who's giving equal access to the throne of God as his sons and daughters, Caesar wasn't doing that, was he? So also here when Jesus talks about this ecclesia, when he's talking about his gathering that he's calling out, when he says he's going to build his, it wasn't like they're, everybody's going, well, what's an ecclesia? What's, what's he talking about? They had already seen it in practice within their culture, but now Jesus is saying he's talking about his, his group of called ones. Well, look at the very words that he uses here in this definition. It's a group of citizens, it's not just anybody, but it's citizens. And citizens at this time, especially when you're talking to both the Jews as well as the Romans, citizenship had its privileges. How many of you have ever traveled outside of the United States? <laughs> the United States. I don't know where the United States is, but the United States. And come back in. Have you ever noticed that there's two lines? One line says citizens. One line says all others. And maybe there's that third line for foreign diplomats traveling with great visas that get you off of everything. Um, but for the citizens, I travel a lot out of the country, and I love coming back to the U.S. Not just because I'm coming back to my family, but I love that whole process of coming in and going, I'm in the short, fast line over there. Yes, I'm a citizen. There's benefits to being a citizen. And so guess what? When Jesus calls out his church, are there benefits to being in the called out ones of Jesus Christ? Oh my gosh, to be a citizen of heaven? Yes. Teresa's up on the front here looking like she's a headbanger from the 80s here. She's got Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody just going on right now at that one spot where the guitar kicks in. And she's just, sorry, I've just been dri driving a long time. Um, and yeah, there are great benefits to being citizens. But we're not just citizens. We're being citizens that are called out. And when Jesus' gospel message goes out and it calls people out, what, is there, what are we being called out of? Anybody? The world sin, and all the negative effects of being a citizen of the world. What's the devil try to do with people? He tries to trick people to see that there's all these great benefits and privileges for staying in the world, right? That's what he does. How many of us experienced that personally and have gone down that road, right? We bought into those lies for a while. But when you hear the calling out of Christ and all of a sudden the light bulbs go on and spiritually all of a sudden you realize, oh my, there's a God in heaven who made this all who really loves me and will take me just as I am right now. 
and he's going to lovingly continue to work with me until I get to see him face to face, that's one of the greatest benefits of being called out. But I love, too, that the word that Jesus chose, not kuriokos, but choosing ecclesia, also talks about it's, you're being called out to a public place. Somewhere along in the development of Christianity, somebody got the idea, it's a great idea for Christians to move into remote places and stay there for the rest of their lives. Right? We've heard about that. Some of us almost moved there. Some of us almost did that thinking that it would be the best way to honor God by getting away from the world 100% and staying there in our holy huddles. But the word that Jesus chose here is for a specific purpose that you would be called out from within the public to another public so that you would be there. Hence the reason why we are called the light of the world, not the light of the desert or the light of the caves or the light of the places where nobody lives. And so we're called out as a public gathering to be an assembly for him. That's what the church is. But when you hear the church and you hear that, did anybody get this picture in their mind when you heard the word church? Yes. Okay. That's a building. And I'm sorry, but we were all taught a wrong thing in Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and here's all the people. It's wrong. And I haven't been able, I'm sorry, to come up with a good rhyme to replace it with, this is a building, not the church, because this is the church. And the church doesn't need this to exist. Because really, this is the picture of the church that we should get. This is what an ecclesia is. And it can be from three to three million, or three gazillion. Let's just go that way right? That's what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about a called out people, not a building. Now, a building is not a bad thing, especially when you live in Pueblo, in Pueblo West, and any place else where the white stuff falls out of the sky that's not volcanic ash. Volcanic ash doesn't really deal well with buildings, takes care of it, and brings them down. What this calling out and what we understand here is that this people group, these This gathering that Jesus is calling to is what his church is supposed to be. It's a group of people committed to a specific cause. Now, buildings have their functions, their tools. We get that. But sometimes the building becomes the central focus, right? Sometimes the church that you go to and the type of building that it is kind of tells everybody else how good your church is by human standards, or how blessed your church is by human standards. Let's put it this way. Would you rather have a Ferrari in a beaten down shack, or would you like to have a really nice garage with an old dilapidated car that doesn't even run? See, what's the purpose of the building? It's really just for what's inside. What's inside is what's important because you can take the Ferrari and take it to other places and put it in different garages. But if you don't have the Ferrari, guess what? You don't have the Ferrari. And that's what God's church is called to be. This is it. Have you thought of yourself as a Ferrari lately? Look at the person next to you. Have you thought of that person as a Ferrari lately? They do. John and Betty were there yesterday slinging boxes with us. I thought to myself when we went to help Mike and Cammy move, you know, it's like, okay, I get there. And I'm going, everybody here is over 50 years old. God, we need some younger people in the church, Lord. Some young, strong-backed people. Please bring them. Because our 80-year-old man, and I'm not going to say how old you are, Betty, are here slinging boxes that are heavy for the rest of us to pick up, right, Ted? Ted's got a boo-boo on his leg. He'll show you later. I'll let him talk all about it from helping them move. But this is what the body is. It's this group of people that have been called out for a specific purpose. And that's what makes this body a Ferrari. Nothing of us. It's the fact that Jesus is the engine within us. Right? So that's what we've got going on here. And so um, the 121 West Adams building, beloved, just keep praying. I I really don't see it happening anymore, which is kind of cool because now once you let something go, now God will bring it back and say, well, do you want it now? Here it is. It's like, oh, no, because is this really what you want for us? Because we want to be focused on the fact of what is it that God 
wants for us. Because this gathering that he's called out, Jesus says something rather interesting about it. He says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What's a gate? Anyone? What is a gate? It's a separator that basically, on one sense, when it's closed, it's defensive. Basically, everybody who's inside the gates, you're good, because nobody from the outside is being allowed in. Gates can then open, which allow the people inside to go out, or possibly others to come in. Jesus says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. When was the last time somebody actually got attacked by a gate? Now, it can't happen in Pueblo West with the winds. Trust me, I understand that one. On a windy day, you forget that it's windy, and you go to open your big old flat wooden gate, and you open it slightly, forgetting that it's windy, and all of a sudden the thing just rips your arm off. Or the other way, you're just walking through and it happens to gust through and slam it in your face. But in terms of what everybody's thinking, do we get attacked by gates? If Jesus says the gates of Hades shall not prevail against his church, what do you think that Jesus is telling his church that they're supposed to be about? Storming. Who said it? Oh, I thought that was was Santa Claus. Oh, man. I thought, yes. Yes. We've got, yeah, okay, for those of you who are new, sorry. Um, Santa goes to our church, the real one, just saying. Okay, so it means that the church's function is to be what? Storming the gates of Hades. Now, okay, before everybody leaves and before nobody comes back next week, this isn't storming in a militant way in the physical sense. Because when we lose sight of what this, how this works out in the actual realm that we're in, we can very easily become something that Jesus never designed his church to be, a.k.a. the crusaders. Okay? That's not what he's talking about, all right? Okay, so this brings us to our second point about the function of the church. In verse 18, Jesus said this, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So we know that the church's function, primarily by what Jesus says here, is to what? Storm the gates of Hades. Does that sound like exciting news to anybody? Yeah, right. Some of you are shaking your head, honestly, no. Because that's what? Scary. I I thought we were about love. Well, guess what? We are. And that is exactly how we storm the gates of Hades. And that's the beautiful thing about this. He's not looking for us to become militant in the physical realm. He's looking for us to become militant in the spiritual realm, which in the physical realm presents itself in a way of love. And if some of you are saying, how can that be? Do you remember when John in the book of Revelation is told that the lamb that was slain or the, the, forgive me, that the line of the tribe of Judah is the one that could open up the books, the seals, only he is worthy. John says he looks at the lion of the tribe of Judah, and what did he see? A lamb as though it had been slain. Beloved, the way heaven sees things and the way that we see things often aren't exactly the same, but they are the same. It's just different perspectives. And so while we are called to storm the gates of Hades, in the physical realm. You know how that looks? Well, look at the life of Jesus. Did you ever see Jesus getting his John Wayne on? No. When Jesus got his John Wayne on, what was he doing? He just loved people. And he loved people with truthful words that sometimes hurt them. Sometimes the truth hurts, doesn't it? And so here's the beautiful picture of this all. While we see here, remember the hymn, Onward, Christian Soldiers? Onward, Christian. Okay, look at the verse. First verse. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, forward into battle. See his banners go. That visual imagery is appropriate when we see it in the context of how Jesus did spiritual warfare. It wasn't about us all of a sudden going down uh, to the local place and buying all camouflage matching uniforms and all of a sudden you know sewing our little freedom calvary libel on and all of a sudden we're the army of god (laughs) you do have freedom within the body 
But we as church leadership are not going to say this is what we're all about because it's got to come out the way that Jesus did it or it doesn't have the proper results. If evangelism, if taking the good news of Jesus was as easy as getting people to say the sinner's prayer, then guess what? Smith and Wesson becomes, or Glock becomes, the easiest way to evangelize. Say this words on this thing or I'm going to send you to hell. But if you'll just read these words, you are saved. It's not that, right? Because if it were just reading those words, we'd have no spiritual battles. The idea is that people actually have to come into an encounter with the God of the universe who brings this great gospel message and they have the opportunity now to say yes or they have the opportunity to say no. That's what this spiritual thing looks like. We end up looking like the Crusades, right? So if we are in function called to go into spiritually war, look at what we here have in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, if you want to turn there, it's right up on the screen. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Jesus' great commission, do you see anywhere in there where we're supposed to be a militant crew that goes out and basically subdues the earth and political realms? and submits everybody to follow to Jesus whether they want to or not. Here's spiritual warfare that he's calling this church, this army of love, these called out ones to go and do. It's to go out and to make disciples. How do you go out and make disciples? You go out and share the gospel. How do you go out and share the gospel? Well, you actually have to kind of open your mouth or open the puppet's mouth <laughs> who are speaking the gospel in the language that you can't speak, but you got this great idea that, hey, we can just play the puppets that speak it in the language and we can do the puppets and they hear it and guess what they do? What do they do, Dave and Mary? They respond. And they don't respond if they don't get a chance to hear the gospel and that's how we make disciples. And then in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Does anybody see in here that we need to go down to the corner uh, drugstore or the corner uh, bar and duke it out with people? No, we wrestle, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. And I guess what? If you've ever opened up your mouth to try to proclaim the gospel of Jesus anywhere to somebody individually or with a group, do you not, have you not experienced the powers and principalities coming at you, or well, actually you experience before you even open it, right? I experience it every morning on Sundays, knowing that I'm coming here. Hell doesn't like pastors that come and t- tell people the truth about Jesus and the word. Anywhere. And so guess what happens? Chink, 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 chink. Pot shots, pot shots, pot shots. That's what he does. That's his MO. And the scripture is very clear. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of his schemes and devices. Jesus' example of how to wage war against the gates of Hades, the word of God, and love. Can anybody here say some words of God? If you can, guess what you can do? You can storm the gates of hell. Can anybody here love with the love of Jesus? Guess what you can do? You can storm the gates of hell. And now, doesn't that take a whole lot of load off this whole storm in the gates of God picture that maybe you had your mind going, honey, we got a Ted think maybe next week we need to go find someplace else. That boo-boo was so bad, you know, we need to go find another church next week because we're talking about it's craziness. No, it's not craziness. It's what Scripture says. Yeah. And in this function, you know what the strategic, plan, the, street, uh, the strategic plan is? Ephesians 4 says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. You know how we actually function as a body of believers that storm the gates of hell? We're equipped to do it. And this is what the church does, the ecclesia does. It equips us to do it. And how do we do it? (laughs) It's through the word of God and through love. Pretty simple, yeah? Some would say then, well, why do we have such a big Bible if it can boil down to that? Well, you remember what Jesus said about the entire law and the prophets? All the law and the prophets hangs on this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you love your neighbors yourself. Basically, uh, about that much of your Bible. 
can be summed up. And some would say, well, then can't we just focus on the summation? Well, focusing on the summation is a good place, but guess what? Any of you have ever tried to get through any college classes by only doing the summations or getting the cliff notes? You might get a C minus, but there's things in there that God uses to change us and to take us to deeper levels of equipping. Because the enemy isn't just rolling over here, beloved. The enemy of our souls is not just rolling over saying, okay, they've got the good news, they've got the truth, they've got God on their side, we're done. Is that what he's doing? Oh no, he's fighting and kicking, he's screaming, he's going all the way and trying to stop us. Now, this is somewhat of a simple summation of what spiritual warfare and this concept of what the church is supposed to be about. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at spiritual warfare a little more in depth before we come back into our study on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But for today, this is where I want to end. Um, I'm going to open to uh, Revelation chapter 21, if you want to turn there. It's the last two verses, or the last two chapters in your Bible, so it's kind of easy to find. It's all the way at the end, right before, if you have a little concordance or whatever back there. But as you're turning there, um, our, our basic vision statement for the church, we try to make it easy on people. For our local congregation, it's three E's. To exalt Jesus, to equip the saints, and to engage the world. <laughs> well... The information <laughs> that we need to understand is that a local body, that falls right into, I believe, what we just read in Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 18. This is all about storming the gates of hell, exalting Jesus, equipping the saints to realize that, hey, exalting or storming the gates of hell really is about loving God and loving people. And then engaging the world is about actually caring enough to do that. Simple, Right? Exalt, equip, engage. This is our ultimate future that we're going to look at here because I, today I want us to understand the basic foundations of the church, function basically, but this is our future. And I hope you see this future as something absolutely amazing. So as I read this, the worship team's going to come up because this will give them time actually to prepare as we get ready to worship the Lord through song again as well as through taking uh, the cup for communion. John writes this in chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. <clears throat> and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with the twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And as he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, 
and height are equal. And then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. The constructions of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy. He was righteous, let him be righteous still. And he was holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds the things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And then if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the truth of your word and thank you for simply in your word making it clear what it is that we as a local body and what your church in general is supposed to be about. We are a group of people who have been called out to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And so Lord, as we worship you uh, in song now and as we proclaim uh, your death and your resurrection until you come in the taking of communion, as we leave this place today, God, help us to understand our place within the body and what you have for us this day and this week. Give us opportunities to lovingly share the truth of the gospel with those around us and give us the unction of your spirit and the power of your spirit and the words of your spirit to do it in a way motivated by love. Lord, thanks for loving us first and we continue to worship you now through song in Jesus' name.